Hey, what's up, Shining Otaku? This is your host, Irvin. And today, this is Shining Spotlight, the, uh, the um, show where we highlight the creatives and the professionals in the industry in order to inspire you guys. Today, we have a, a renowned writer, translator, and interpreter who is extremely pivotal to manga's role for English speakers. He's translated some of the first narrative manga that came over to the States directly from Osamu Tezuka, has written books over the years from manga, manga, the world, to Japanese comics, to the Astro Boy essays. Um, Osam, he's also done, um, um, you know, uh, books like um, uh, the um, the uh, Astro Boy essays, Osamu Tezuka, Mighty Adam, the the manga anime at Revolution, and he's also a a award winning author from doing manga to manga. Today we welcome Frederick shot or fred shot to the show today thank you so much for coming on today thank you it's a pleasure to be here <laughs> so i stumbled a little bit on that intro but i want to let everybody That's know okay. today my co-host uh che baker couldn't make it today he's had a few technical difficulties and a few other things going on, on the back end so just apologies for that but you know the show is going to go on and we have a lot of important questions to ask today so fred I want to know, like, with the whole manga industry, you know, the way it is today, before we even get into everything else, what do you think of how much manga's evolved from back in the time, I'm going to say maybe the 70s or so when you first encountered manga to now? How do you feel like manga's changed from then to now? Uh, well, when I first encountered manga, I, I have to say, I mean, I was actually in Japan when I was 15 in 1965, which is a long, long time ago. But there, the manga were not visible the way they are now in, in Japanese society. I mean, they were out there. But I really noticed them uh, when I was in university in Japan in 1970, because I was in a dormitory um, in Tokyo at a Japanese university. And uh, it was just amazing to me because college students were walking around with these big fat manga magazines and manga had achieved a certain status among uh, university students I'd say and also uh, um, factory workers they were kind of a um, they were a badge I guess of being a little bit different and they were kind of like rock and roll in the United States they were something that were adopted by an older age group than were originally targeted because manga, of course, uh, you know, most of them started out being targeted for younger children. And, of course, it depends how you define manga, but the long narr narrative, long arc stories were uh, in the 50s and early 60s. I think they were mainly for children. So uh, I don't think university students were reading them that much in um uh, you know, the early 60s or anything like that. But when you get by the time you get to 1970, it's kind of similar to the United States. You have a youth revolution in Japan and you have people who become proud of the fact that they're big fans of, of comics, just like in America. You had, you know, um, people who were like 20 and they were proud of reading, you know, Spider-Man, that kind of thing. Um, but even then, manga were not like they are now. Now they're really, I think, um, they're a mass medium. And there's manga magazines, as you know, for just about everybody in every genre that you can imagine. So they're kind of like, you know, television or um, now I guess it would be the internet. There's something that every that just about everybody is aware of that, and people have read, and they have favorite stories and so forth. It's really a mass medium today, I would say, and and just about every subject, as I, as I said is covered by manga now. So that's a big change. That's a huge change. They're, they're, a, yeah, sure. they're, a, very, they're a very developed and, and almost adult medium now. So when I think of like, when you mentioned a couple of things that were interesting to me, um, and I'm sure a lot of people may not even be aware, like, you know, of course we're talking about like narrative manga, you know, the term manga has been very, yeah. um, has a, yeah, very used. You know, it's been there's a lot of complexities to it that a lot of people don't yeah. um, really realize. Right. Would you mind like kind of expanding on that a little bit for people a little bit? Yeah, no, I think in the English speaking world, manga is a not only a, 
a very used word, but it's it's a very abused word, <laughs> frankly, because in in of course in Japan, as you know, uh, manga is a generic term. It it means just comics, cartoons, uh, and 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 other things as well. It's a much more broad uh, term than is used in North America, for example, where it usually refers to Japanese comics. And usually, I think among fans today, it's long arc comics, long arc story, uh, narrative stories are what people think of from Japan, and often with big eyes and so forth and so on. Uh, but of course, in Japan, it, that's not what they are at all, although they include that. Um, but manga can be single panel cartoons. Uh, they can be what are really popular in Japan are four panel cartoons. Those are newspaper comic strips usually but also in magazines. Uh, and they can also be um, you know, long, arc, long arc stories. They can be the short stories, long narratives like novels, um, gags, there's all kinds of things. And they even blur into other areas. So for example, if you're, if you're an old person, say a little bit, I'm old, but even if you're older than I am, uh, you might think that manga could even be uh, like animation. So. For example, in the 1950s, um, people didn't use the word anime in Japan, and it was uh, they would often refer to anime as manga ega, which is art manga manga films. And in fact, the the very early Japanese animation that came out even before the war that was usually referred to as manga ega. And in the 60s and 70s, you might have a mother yelling at her children and say, you know. Stop watching those stupid manga ega. She wouldn't say those stupid cartoons. She would say you know, manga ega, and that meant car that meant cartoons on the box, like we might say in in America. At some point, people might say, you know, hey, you know, you know, you've, you've seen enough of those cartoons. You know, watch something else. Kind of like that. Nowadays, you don't hear the word manga applied to anime so much in Japan, but it it does have that past. Uh, and there are other sort of f formats that are sometimes labeled as manga. One of them is uh, emonogatari, which are uh, Ill they're they're really narrative illustrations. So they don't have word balloons, but they have uh, the illustration, and then they might have like text be uh, below. It's sort of like Hal Foster's Prince Valiant uh, in North America was took that format, and, we, and I guess in the United States we call that a comic strip. Um, now, uh, Emonogatari are not so popular because it's even Japan has gone very much for this long arc narrative uh, manga, but it's still a generic term. It doesn't mean Japanese comics at all. So, uh, when Japanese people are talking among themselves, and and they might say, you know, they might say, well, in America, they might ask somebody, well, do you have manga? They just mean, do you have comics in America or cartoons in America? They don't mean Japanese manga necessarily. It's a generic term. But that's something that's often, I think, really misunderstood here in the U.S. because here it's used to, in North America at least, it's used to refer to mainly Japanese comics. And uh, in Japan, it's it's much more broad than that, much more generic. But I could go on and on for every. Oh no, it's fun. <laughs> you know, like, like I just think that the the tradition of manga goes back, you know, yeah. so far. Like, you know, it's funny. Up until um, like recently, I used to think, used to think that manga, like, maybe went back to just like Osamu Tezuka, and then that was it. But it's like, no, like, like Osamu Tezuka, you know, as important to manga as that he is, you know, and that's not to minimize yeah. that by any yeah. means, you know, um, you know the. The word or the um, the aspect of uh, I guess cartooning, if you will, there's a tradition even before that, even before oh, yeah. you know his time. And I just I think that's important yeah. to note for you know uh, the audience out there because I think yeah. you know a lot of us, especially you know um, you know people who maybe you know are um, you know started you know reading manga maybe in like the 2000s or whatever, you know our minds only go back so far because that's all we really know. But like you know, there was a time even before that. So the tradition is, is um, you know, is uh, pretty thick, you know, when it comes yeah. to uh, cartooning and, you know, manga or yeah. even, um, um, and I was going to ask you about uh, Gekika, you know. Yeah, like, Gekika, yeah. 
like manga eventually, or I'm gonna say ask like the, you know, you have the narrative manga, like the kind that Osamu Tezuka did um, mm-hmm. that um, eventually ended up, and I think you referenced this in one of your books, you know, ended up evolving into like uh, um, Gekika, you know, um, how do you feel about like where some of those, how, how did some of that happen? And then what do you think of like the way that manga is trending today? Do you think manga is continuing to evolve? Um, well, I think, first of all, in terms of the terminology, um, you know, the word manga goes back a long time, and many people uh, have, uh, at least have said that one of the first uses was in a work created by Hokusai, who's a famous woodblock printer. Uh, it's a series of illustrations, a collection of illustrations in multiple volumes. Um, and that was called manga. And... But it wasn't comics. It wasn't really cartoons. It was actually, if you look at the actual books, they were pretty serious illustrations. But among the illustrations, some of them were funny, and some of them actually had panels, uh, and some of them had, you know, breakdown of time in, in terms of using panels, and which are sort of fundamental to comic books today. But over the ages, the word that was used to refer to like cartoons and what we think of today as manga has really changed. So at one point they were called Tobae, which are named after this monk, uh, Toba, who created, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, some cartoon-like uh, scrolls. He was a Buddhist monk. Um, and then later on, you, you heard people say ponchi which are punch yep. pictures, and the word punch came from the British Punch and Judy, and then there was a magazine in in Britain called Punch, which was had a lot of cartoons in it. So the the word that's used to refer to what we think of today as cartoons has has really changed. And one thing I I, I always find in terms of you know how the word is used in the United States is I, I always get hooked up a little bit because. I know a lot of people they use the word manga uh, uh, as as uh, in plurals or mangas. <laughs> so if you speak Japanese, that's really a weird concept because it's more like I always try to tell people it's more like sheep. You know, we don't say sheep's. You know, <laughs> it's 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 manga. Manga are, are plural. They can be and give me that manga. It could be a singular manga, or, you know, one manga, <laughs> or or it could be a whole flock of mangas. You know, I'm not. Just, I'm just joking here, but yeah. it's sort of like sheep, it, you know, singular, plural, they're both the same. In terms of, like, Gekiga, uh, um, you don't hear the word Gekiga so much anymore. That was really a big, I think, um, you know, 1960s, 70s phenomenon, and that was coined by a group of people who wanted a more realistic kind of approach to a filmic pro- a, and serious approach to manga. Um, so... You know, the word is still very much in use, but one of the ironies that is, and, and, and in this sense, it's very similar to the United States where people struggle with this word comics. I mean, what's a comic book? You know, is it funny? Is it comic? No, I mean, a lot, you know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of comics are are not funny at all, right? You know, they're really serious. You know, you can have, uh, you know, people dying and weeping, and you might weep when you read it, and we still call it a comic book. So, um, to me, manga are like sheep. Singular, plural, both. Um, but I was trying to mention earlier, one of the things I find kind of amusing is that, you know, in North America, we struggle with the concept or the word comics because what are comics? Are they comic? Are they funny? Not necessarily. Uh, so people flounder about and they come up with different terms. And sometimes in North America, we use the term graphic novels. Uh, to kind of get away from this issue of comic books not being comic all the time when they have like, you know, murders and and people weeping and that sort of thing. And in Japan, it's similar. People struggle with, you know, how to describe these things. And probably most people are familiar with the word manga, but in Japan, ironically, one of the words that publishers have turned to is komiko. So it's like appropriating (laughs) the American word comics. Uh, with all of its problems, into Japanese to try and solve this Japanese problem, which is, you know, what are manga really? And the word comic is often used by publishers to refer to um, paperback books, 
comics. Uh, if you go into a store in Japan, you'll often see that you know on signs is, it will say comics, and that will often refer to uh, paperback books or tankobon. Uh, so in Japan, people struggle with this terminology just the way people in in North America struggle with it with the word comics in English. It's almost like everyone's kind of borrowing, you know, words, but then, you know, there's the negative connotation that can come with those words, too. That's right. And 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 the words are never totally satisfactory. So that's why in Japan you had at one point people were using the word gekiga. And now you have publishers who are using the word, especially for tankobon or paperbacks, they might say komiksu. And uh, it's very confusing, but kind of fun to watch. <laughs> So what is your opinion then of, um, or what I should say, what, yeah, what is your opinion of like, oh, like original English language manga? Have you heard of that uh, before? And like, is there such a thing like original English language manga? Uh, well, OEL, uh, I mean, I think that's been around probably since the, were, the year around 2000, something like that. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it kind of came into wider use around 2000, 2002. Um, I mean, it's it's fine, but there's really no reason f to use the term, I think. I mean, we just need another word because the word, I mean, the worst problem is, is that some people think that manga are just a certain kind of comics and they're, you know, big eyes and uh, stars and, in the eyes of like female characters you know kind of softer features and that kind of thing um and those are among of course but you're breaking up just a little I think bit comic well, they might um actually try. Yeah. okay i don't know why that is um but I'm back, right? Yeah, I can hear you now. Am I back? I can I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hello. You can yeah, hear there's me. There's a little bit of lag. I, I think it's unfortunate when when or comics are just big eyes. Can you hear me? Just a little bit of lag. Let's give it like Hello? like ten seconds. Yeah, why is that? I mean, I don't understand why that is. Because you were lagging too. I mean, this is weird. Maybe it's because it's 625 here and m maybe everybody's watching something on TV or something. On, <laughs> oh, no, I think now we're good. I, I think we're good now. I think now I can I can hear you clearly. Okay. Can you hear me clearly? I can hear you. You were kind of breaking up a little bit too. Um, but anyway, yeah, I think sometimes it's almost like you have to knows? give it a minute and then it'll, it'll correct itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some Somebody in the background is pedaling really fast and, and we were getting ahead of them. So and now they've probably caught up to us. <laughs> uh, but, so you know, what was I saying? Um, in, in terms of manga, one of the things I think a little bit, that's a little bit unfortunate is many people, when they want to create a manga in Japanese style, that they tend to focus on the big eyes or the... You know the softer features that kind of thing when in reality um, that's not i think the essence of japanese manga um is, that's a, a, i think a certain a misunderstanding but it's an it's an easy to understand misunderstanding no no i i honestly i would i think that it would be important if we all kind of hear what what is the essence of manga um i think that's something that uh, a lot of us out here especially i'm, I'm just gonna say like newcomers a lot of us yeah. don't know that, you know. So, what would you yeah. say? I, I honestly think, you know, um, the fact that and I don't know if a lot of people know this, but I'm going to go ahead and say this right now for a lot of the audience. Um, Fred, you know, had you know was even close friends with Osamu Tezuka. So, those of you out there who are you familiar with Astro Boy, you know, familiar with with um, you know any of the um you know the works that came from osama tezuka phoenix you know a lot of his popular works Fred knew osama tezuka pretty intimately so i i think you know uh 
just not just on that, but just, you know, I'm going to say, you know, from being involved in the industry so long, I definitely would like to hear your perspective on what is the essence of it. Um, well, first of all, I should start out and say that, you know, I, I knew Tesco very well. I was um, his interpreter mostly. So, uh, you know, it's not like I, I called him up uh, and, and, and we went over to his house every night and went drinking or something like that. But I, I knew him very well as his interpreter and as his friend, I guess, is the way to put it. He was much older than I am. So to me, he was like this, you know, exalted figure, you know, <laughs> totally different realm. Um, but he was very, very kind to me. And uh, I, I, I like to think of him as as having been a friend as well. But in the Japanese context and in my the reality in which I, I lived, of course, he was older and someone I respected enormously. So I should just qualify that. Um, you know, in terms of what manga are, I think, as you know, as we just talked about, the definition in Japan is very vague. The definition of comics in America is very vague. So then, when you start talking about, well, what are the, what are manga in Japan? What are the hallmarks of manga in Japan? And I think, if we're going to look at, um, you know, long art stories. One of the hallmarks is that manga, there's this belief in Japan, I think, among many people that manga can be treated the same way that um, novels and films are. And you can do the same things with novels, uh, with manga that you can with novels and films. And that's something that Tezuka really helped develop, but he's not the only one who developed that idea. Of course, many, many artists uh, subsequently since Tezuka have, have further developed that idea. But it is something that Tezuka uh, really hoped to achieve in his life and that to get manga or the recognition that novels and films have. And I think in Japan today, actually, if you look at what's being created, there are a lot of things that they may be manga, but they really are just as sophisticated and thought provoking as novels, good novels and films. And I think that's something to really strive for and to emulate. Uh, it's, I don't think it's so much the big eyes and just the soft features and, you know, a certain, I don't know how to say it, but there are certain aspects of a lot of Japanese anime, especially, and manga that are very superficial. And I don't think it's necessary to fi be fixated on that because there's something much more fundamental. Uh, there's, th there's an essence there that's often being missed, which is, which is, uh, just approaching the media and trying to approach it in as sophisticated a way as possible and 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 experiment and and do what people do with novels and films okay so when you're because obviously you, you have translated manga like going back to like i'm gonna say like the um early like late 70s early 80s around in that time period yeah, like yeah, yeah so you have experience doing that what is the process, or at least what was the process back then, you know, in how you would actually translate something like that? Like, would you just sit, would you kind of just do it like roughly and then kind of try to convey it in Japanese to the the author and see what they think to see if the message is getting across? Or do you just kind of do it and they trust you on how the process works? Like, how would I do that if I was interested in doing something like that back then? Uh, well, I... I started out around 1977 and some friends of, of mine and I in Tokyo got together and we put together a group called Dadakai, um, which was a pun on the word Dada for Dada Association. And then also um, Kai is just means a club or association. So it was kind of a an awkward pun, but we, there were just, there were four of us, two, Americans, myself and my friend Jared Cook, and then um, Shinji Sakamoto, and then uh, Midori Ueda, who they were both uh, students at the university which I had been in. I was working as a professional translator then, translating all kinds of like government documents and business documents and just everything. Uh, but we got together and we had this idea that maybe we could translate manga because we loved manga and we wanted somehow to show people outside of Japan, hopefully, that manga were this very creative medium 
of expression. And so we were trying to think, well, where do we start? And we were big fans. Everybody was a fan of of Tezuka's, especially the Phoenix, which is a long series that he did. And that was the first work that we actually uh, tried to translate. So we did five volumes. It's, I think it's a total of 13, 12, 13 volumes together. So each volume is over 200 pages. So it's quite long. Um, so we did five volumes. And at that time, we didn't know what we were doing, really. We didn't know how to approach this. And we didn't know how to approach publishers properly. Uh, so we did five volumes, and what we did was we whited out, we used whiteout, physical whiteout, and whited out the Japanese text in a Xerox of the original Japanese. And then we wrote in, in English in the balloons using very poor handwriting at the time. So people could at least read the story, even though they would have to read from right to left, which was totally weird at the time uh, and then we gave this translation to Tezuka Productions because we had permission to do this but we after we'd finished these five volumes we gave these translations this rough translation to Tezuka Productions and it, it sat in Tezuka Productions for 25 years and collected dust uh, we couldn't get anybody interested in it in the United States uh, and Interestingly, we couldn't even get uh, publisher publishers interested in it. And in the beginning, um, even when Viz Media was formed, originally they weren't interested in it either. <laughs> oh wow! Uh, so twenty five years go by, and then and then finally, um, Viz Media uh, decided that they would like to publish it. And then my friend Jared and I, the original group that we had, Dadakai, had 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 long ago. Uh, been disbanded, but Jared and I, so two members of Dadakai, we finished the rest of the Phoenix, the rest of the volumes in around 2002. So um, that's the story of how uh, the first translation I, I did <laughs> got eventually, eventually got published. Um, but in the beginning, it, it's kind of interesting to think about this because we, we didn't know how to make the comic appealing to an American audience. And what had to be done, as I found out later, and, and when I, I tried to, in, in my first book on Japanese comics, I had excerpts in the back. And in those excerpts from four different artists, I tried to make them as American as possible. So in those cases, the works were all read from left to right the way americans would read a comic book you would read them from left left to right and i tried to do semi-professional letting lettering i had some friends uh, who are professionals could give me hints and so forth and i studied lettering a little bit and then we i did also the um the sound effects, I redid the sound effects so they would look normal on the page. And uh, actually, that's the way most Japanese manga were published uh, in the United States uh, for a long time because that was the only way. Chance for me to let you guys all know um, or to kind of do our announcement for the Honeycomb Hideout. For those of you guys out there who like um, podcasts that are interested in anything related to nerd culture. You know, if you like Howard Stern, kind of like something for, with that feel, give the Honeycomb Hideout a listen. Uh, you can check it out on Spotify. It's on Apple Podcasts. You know, really good show, you know, sister show, actually. So if you guys like our show, you'll definitely like the Honeycomb Hideout. Listen to it on your next car drive. There will be a link to it down below in the description. Um, and also to make one more quick announcement, we are soon going to be coming out with our um, anthology series, Origami Super Punch, which is going to have you know, a collection of um, manga-inspired comics. 
in there you're going to have from the comic beta which we put a few posts up on our page to even Killbox, which is one of our other stories our battle rap manga that's going to be coming out soon um but with that being said let's jump right back into this interview make sure you subscribe and hit the like button if you haven't hit it already um to be able to see more interviews just like this but let's get some knowledge and hear again from the great fred shot okay um so, so fred where were we i think where we left off we were talking about manga and the um um you know kind of the process with translation um you know you were talking about um how the, you had to white out a lot of the pages. We were talking about lettering, kind of what went into um, the process of back in the, you know, like the late 70s, early 80s. But I did have a question about that process. So um, when I think about like the manga from back then, I know um, another manga that I believe kind of was also kind of accredited for being one of the first to be translated coming over was um, Barefoot Gen or like, um, I believe it might've been called, like it was the one shot I saw it. What was that like? Because I've, I've, you know, I've always been a little bit confused between some of the history with that, and then also I hear sometimes like there, are like, like for example, there was, um, well, you know what? I want to start with that first. I have another question, a follow up to that, but let's start with that first. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there was another group of people in Tokyo the same time that my friends and I were trying to translate some Japanese manga. And that was called Project Gen. And Project Gen was a group of volunteers, of which I became a member. Uh, and uh, it was a, a group of volunteers who were motivated by the idea that the world needed to know the story of Keiji Nakazawa, who was a survivor of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and wrote a very long, uh, or created a very long manga series that was loosely based on his experience. Uh, it was, I say loosely based because it wasn't really totally autobiographical, but it was based on the things he had experienced and saw. Uh, and the group in Tokyo, Project Gen, was a variety of both Japanese and there were some Americans and other nationalities involved. And the first volume came out around 1977 i believe and uh was sent to the united states and distributed in the states mainly by we're cutting out a little bit here but it was sent to the united states and distributed mainly by churches and by anti-nuclear groups so it was not uh, a very commercially successful work but it attracted a lot of attention i think among some people, uh, including the, some American comic book creators. And then moving forward, um, my friend Jared and I, who were members of Dadakai, we were also asked to translate the second volume of Barefoot Gen. So we did that in 1978. And since then, there have been um, more volumes. Uh, actually, the whole series has been translated by a variety of people and retranslated by people. Um, and many of the volumes were translated by a friend of mine named Alan Gleason. And he also worked with other people uh, in the Project Gin organization in Japan and also in the United States. So it gets kind of complicated because there was, in terms of the timeline, there was overlap between the group I was uh, involved in starting called Dadakai and this other group in Tokyo called Project Gin. Uh, but they had different a different focus uh, when barefoot gen which was the title of keiji nakazawa's work about the atomic bombing was sent over here from japan it was printed in japan and sent over here it didn't sell very well because it never got into commercial channels uh, it was too unusual it was a big book of, of a physical paperback book of a couple hundred pages and people didn't know how to handle it at that time so there was a publisher in san francisco a very small publisher run by a friend of mine called leonard rifus and he had a company called edge comics and he thought that uh, what he should do is uh, 
create a Americanized version of of Barefoot Gen, and that became known as Gen of Hiroshima. And in that case, all the pages were flopped, and it was done in a very American style, professional lettering, and so forth and so on. Uh, but Leonard, I think, realized very quickly that if he were going to do the entire work in American comic book style, in other words, issuing comics of only 35 or whatever pages, it would probably take him decades to finish the entire series. So that wasn't a very commercially viable effort. So then the next idea was to create uh, something similar that was a one-off work that would fit into the American publishing format at the time, because we're looking at about 1980, 80, 82. And that was a work that also the same artist, Keiji Nakazawa, had created, which was a truly autobiographical work about his, his own experiences. And that was called Oreva Mita, or I Saw It in English. And um, my friend Leonard at Edge of Comics, he completely flopped it and colorized it. And it was professionally lettered. I think I helped do some of the sound effects. I didn't do the translation on it. My friend Alan Gleason did the translation on it. Um, and Leonard uh, produced this, and it was, about, I think it's about over 40 pages long, but it fit perfectly in the American comic book format. And I also recall that I really pushed Leonard, because uh, I was living in San Francisco at the same time, as he was and i really pushed him i think to go big because he had a really good deal on the printing <laughs> i forget how many thousands he printed but leonard wound up with uh, stacks of i saw it in his garage which sat there for a couple decades and he may even still have some i don't know um, <laughs> but it's kind of a legendary work right now and it was and the idea was to create something that would look like an American comic book that American readers could read it without any, you know, resistance at all. So it was all flopped. You'd read it from left to right. Sound effects were, you know, redone and uh, it's colorized. But that was a very early uh, effort to somehow get American readers to read a Japanese manga. And then, of course, after that, you know, if you spring ahead, five, six years, eventually uh, you saw first comics in Chicago and then Viz in uh, San Francisco brought out Japanese manga. Again, all flopped, all uh, lettered in American style and so forth and so on. And of course, later after that, there's uh, Marvel bring, Epic brings out uh, Akira by Otomo, Katsuhi Katsuhiro Otomo. And that's colorized again. So, and it took a long time before American readers got to the point where they could actually read Japanese comics from right to left instead of left to right. And that that took many many years. Uh, and it's kind of an interesting phenomenon that I'm always surprised more people in academia haven't studied because there's so many people in academia now writing about manga and studying manga. And it's such a weird phenomenon to think that American readers can be that flexible that they can actually read from right to left instead of left to right in terms of at least in terms of you know turning the pages and whatnot and it's an issue that i'm really fascinated by because it turns out that actually american readers are much more flexible than japanese readers are japanese readers don't like to read for the pages from left to right did you it, and there's been a lot of attempts to introduce american comics that and, and have have them read left to right, but the, generally the readers d don't buy it. So, what do you think that Americans like about manga? Like, is it just like the um, the experience, like you know, seeing the the perspective of the Japanese, or do you think maybe it's the styling of it? I think both. I mean, I could rattle on forever and ever about these issues, but um, I think for a lot of American comic book readers, the subject matter and the pacing of Japanese manga is, is it's very different. It's interesting, and it it's a little bit more experimental on, on some levels than uh, American comics are often. And part of that is because of the number of pages that 
uh, Japanese artists have had available to them. Uh, in an American comic book, you know, until fairly recently, most people were limited to uh, maybe, you know, 40 pages per issue, 42 pages per issue or something like that. Uh, and in Japan, artists have, when they were developing these long arc stories, they could tell a story that's you know thousands of pages long. So that changes the ways you can express yourself. And I think that um, many aspects of that have been fascinating to American readers. And then there are other issues because in a way, you know, Japan is a very different culture. So there are different constraints on artists in Japan than there are in the United States. So in many areas, Japanese artists seem freer than they might hear. Uh, you can talk about things that are a little harder to talk about in the United States sometimes uh, and vice versa. Uh, and then I think also just people find it refreshing. And I think among, there was a period, maybe, maybe not now, because I think manga have, have gone so mainstream in, in North America that they're almost taking over the whole business. But there was a period where I think a lot of young people felt there was kind of a cachet to being able to read these things that their parents couldn't understand or read. So it's like, you know, hey, you know, we're into this kind of esoteric cultish manga thing. And and then, of course, anime has had a huge, huge influence on the uh, popularity of manga in general. So from, you know, uh, getting to know um, or, you know, at least, um, you know, over, over time, you know, translating for Tezuka and, you know, um, you know, um, being able to, you know, help him and, you know, being able to try to push manga out there, you know, as it relates to, you know, abroad from Japan. Was there really an interest in like um, being able to get like American readership or was there an interest? Because I mean, I read about how, you know, he had interest in, you know, other types of, you know, comics and, you know, he even, I believe, um, I don't want to be, uh, putting out misinformation out there, but I believe he was interested in, you know, creatives like Mobius, you know, people know Mobius, the, uh, you know, the French um, um, artist, you know, um, so he had a lot of different influences, but like, was there a lot of interest in, I guess, um, pushing things, you know, in the States and, you know, being able to kind of make a foundation elsewhere or, you know, how, what was that like? Uh, well, Tezuka was unusual in Japan in the sense that he had already created a manga work that had been animated in Japan and exported to the United States. So uh, he already had experience in exporting his animation, which was Astro Boy in the United States. And he was quite unique among um, manga artists in the sense that he was very aware of not only what was going on in Europe and the United States, and he was in touch with people in the industry in both countries. And he was an animator as well as a manga artist. So he was really in a unique position. Uh, there were other Japanese works that had inspired uh, animation and had been exported to the United States after Astro Boy, but Astro Boy was the first 30 minute TV series, anime series to be exported to the United States. And that put Tezuka in a completely unique position. So he was always interested in what was going on overseas. And I think he was interested in being, um, and reaching out to audiences in North America and in Europe, even though he knew how difficult it was. And he wanted Japanese manga to be better recognized, I believe, but there was no overt plan. There was, he never had a, a overt plan uh, in, a, in a grand scheme of things. He just, I think, hoped that uh, his work would be better recognized overseas. Like most artists, he, you know, he was hoping for better recognition. So there was no there was no grand plan, but he was better positioned than anyone else to uh, get his work introduced overseas because of his connection with animation. There were already anime fans in the United States, uh, in the sense that there was a a bunch of young adults who had been raised on Astro Boy when. 
Tezuka expressed interest in, for example, having my friends and I translate the Phoenix manga. And Tezuka very early went to LA. He'd been to New York, you know, he'd sort of very quickly met Walt Disney at the New York World's Fair in 1964, that kind of thing. Uh, he had a lot more knowledge than, than anybody else. So, and he, he, I, I think he was always hoping that his work would get more recognized overseas. So with my question is, is like, I, when I look at like, for example, Astro Boy, when it came over to the States and um, if I'm not mistaken, you know, from my own research, uh, Gold Key Comics was um, like, they had published like a, like, like an issue of like Astro Boy, like, or they did it like an issue because they did a lot of different comics at the time, like the Flintstones, all types of stuff. I'm kind of curious why was there, and I mean, I know this would be something, you know, you may not be able to inform me on, but like why uh, Tezuka didn't at that time make more of a push to see if maybe they would push more and more Astro Boy out, like, you know, the, maybe the whole series at the time. Uh, well, I think he, you know, Tesla was a very, very smart man, uh, super smart, kind of a genius. One of the few people I've met, I'd say, was a real genius, and I'm sure he knew that that would have been way, way too early. Uh, the Gold Key Comics was not done by Tezuka, as you know. That was done by an American artist. It was completely redrawn, and it was based on the animation, not on the original Japanese manga. At that point in America, it's important to realize that most Americans knew very little about Japan. When the comic came out and when the anime came out uh, in 1963, you know, American knowledge of Japan was pretty, pretty limited and people were not thinking of manga or <laughs> anything beyond probably Sukiyaki and uh, Mount Fuji and, you know, World War II and Geisha and that kind of thing. Uh, most of the people who watched the Astro Boy animation in the United States, of course, were kids and they had no idea that it was even made in Japan. They, they just thought it was a, something fun and something interesting. And, uh, you know, the people at NBC Enterprises knew, but other than that, I think for most people had didn't have a clue who were watching it. So Tezuka, you know, he's a very smart man. He, he, he would have known it was way, way, way too early to try and get people to read Japanese manga. They weren't ready. <laughs> they were not ready. They were not ready. I mean, even in Japan in 1963, there were, you know, unless you're talking about very small children, most people were not reading uh, long narrative manga. They, they just were not that popular. Okay. So uh, just coming up on the last... Uh bit of this uh interview um i'm curious have you ever had and maybe you have and i'm and you know i apologize if, if this information is out there and i've missed it but have you ever created your own comic or have you ever had an interest in creating your own comic uh you know if i had the ability i i think i would have loved to create a comic uh i wouldn't want to become a popular japanese manga artist because i've known a lot of manga artists and worked with them and it's for me it would be an unbearable life i mean the pressure if you're a commercially successful artist in japan the, the life you have to lead is so difficult and so has to be so controlled and disciplined and you don't have much free time and uh i, I wouldn't be able to do that but i i enjoy drawing uh every year at new year's i draw a new year's card based on the Japanese and Chinese Zodiac. And uh, it's a cartoon. And you can see them all on my website, actually. I have, I think, 40 or more years now up on my website. And there was a period where I used to do, you know, four, five panel cartoon strips, comic strips that I occasionally uh, had published in a local translators magazine a very obscure sort of thing so i you know I, it would have been fun but it, it wasn't in my destiny i guess um before we conclude i just wanted to give a plug for something is that okay 
Oh, for sure. Can you hear me? Go ahead. I'm like, we, we all want to hear it. Um, there's an award in Japan. It's called the um, International Japan Manga Award. And uh, I'm on the executive committee for that. It's run by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And it's a global award. And if anybody watching this likes Japanese manga and is an artist and has been published, uh, it's a wonderful award, even though there's no money involved, it's a wonderful award to participate in. Uh, and you can find a lot of information about it on the web. Uh, there are submissions now from all around the world and the level of quality of artists from around the world who submit their works now to this award is really astounding. Uh, people win from Europe, Asia, Mongolia, Africa, the Middle East. Uh, they have up to sometimes 400 submissions from around the world. But if there are any artists uh, who are listening to this, uh, if you go on the web and you look for the Japan International Manga Award, uh, you'll find a lot of information on how to apply. And it's really a lot of fun and it's worth worth looking into. So what are the requirements? If let's say someone's interested in that, what would be the requirement? Uh, it has to be an original work. That's number one. <laughs> It's, I, I just wanted to mention that because it's a, it's something that a lot of people still don't know about, but the quality of the submissions from around the world now are just so high. And uh, I recommend, you know, just looking on the web, you can see all of the uh, requirements are listed in quite, quite a bit of detail. And uh, I can send you later the URL if you want for people to oh for sure we, we're, we're gonna put that link you're actually gonna see that link down below so if you guys are watching this make sure you check it out down below make sure you look at the the submissions and submits look at you know submit your work you know push it out there and share it as well you know it's always good to be able to share this information out there even if you know someone who might want to submit something now that sounds fine that's all i want last... to advertise <laughs> Oh no, my, I have one more final question for you. You know, this is this is a, a big one. This is our traditional question we ask on this show. What is your end game? Meaning, what you know, when you look at your your career, you know, in terms of uh, being involved in the industry, whether it be you know interpretation, you know, um, translating manga, or even writing the the um, the amazing award winning books that you've given, give, chronicalizing the history. You know, or it could be something different. How do you want your work or your career to be, you know, um, either remembered or what is your actual goal that you have in mind that maybe you have still yet to hit? Um, I, I just hope that um, pe people, in terms of manga, at least in the work I've done related to manga, I hope it has helped people enjoy manga more and become more aware of what manga are and how fascinating and fun they are. Um, but that's the main thing in terms of my work with manga. In terms of my other writing, I, it's all related to Japan and I just hope that I've helped to encourage more communication between Japan and America and that um, people who are interested in Japan, that they can become interested in some of these more niche areas, whether it's manga or some of the history works that I've written about. Because in learning about this, you, you also learn about America, which has always been something that I, I've gained a lot from it. I've learned a lot. I didn't grow up in the United States, so I've learned a lot about the United States in, in reading manga and 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 being able to see the united states from the outside it's it's helped me a lot i've learned a lot so that's well it. fred thank you so much for coming on the show today is that, like if i'm interested in 
picking up any of your, you know, um, any of the books that you've written, whether it be about manga or it be about just relations between, you know, America, Japan or whatever uh, works that you have. Where can I find it? Where's the best place where I can buy it from you directly so that that money goes into your pocket? Uh, there's no way to buy it from me directly, but anything you buy indirectly is fine. And hopefully some of the <laughs> profit will roll into my uh, my pocket, but I, I don't expect much. But um, you can get as much information as you want on me, I think, from my website. It's www.jai2.com, uh, and that's J-A-I and the number two dot com. Uh, and then, of course, my books are usually available in, you know, online retailers, that kind of thing. You'll struggle to find them in bookstores, but my books are... Uh, they're available for people who are in the know, you know, <laughs> yeah, on, on uh, online retailers. So, or you yeah. could probably find it in your local library too. But I suggest buying. Yeah, the library. Yeah, the library's okay too. I mean, you know, that's fine too. <laughs> but I would suggest buying it. Like, there's a lot of good stuff. And honestly, Fred is is the I almost feel like one of the center points of you know when it comes to understanding you know, manga. I mean, you know, we've had uh, Ika Axner on there, you know, big ups to Ika, you know, and he even did this, like, you know, Fred um, actually um, gave like a little review on the back of the cover of this book. So, it's good, you know, I'm referencing this book, but there's a lot of, lot of people in the industry who, you know, when it comes to knowing about manga, they, they um, go to Fred. So I really want to say Thank you for even taking the time to come on today. You know, we're honored and flattered that you, um, you know, took time out of your day to, to um, a, uh, speak with all of us and, you know, kind of, uh, you know, highlight, you know, and let us know, you know, what you know. And um, thank you for what you've done for um, pushing manga out there. Because a lot of us, a lot of people out here probably wouldn't know manga like they think they would know it. They, they think of all the, like the Dragon Balls and all that other stuff, but they don't think about how, all that came to be and you know if it wasn't for you know um you know people like you who translated these works and pushed them we wouldn't have it like that here so thank you well i i it's been fun uh, i'm sorry there seems like there was so much so many problems with the connection but i don't know if that's on this side or your side or maybe they're little chipmunks annoying at the internet connection somewhere i don't know i don't know what it is but Oh, no, it's fine. And, you know, for a yeah. lot of you guys watching, a lot of that that you guys see is probably edited out anyway. There might still be a little bit in, in this video that you've seen, you know, because we've had a, a little bit of a of lag. But um, thank you guys all for watching this video. Make sure you guys subscribe. You know, we have another interview coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, if you guys ever have someone that you would like to see on the show, let us know. You can always send, put it in the comments, send us an email. You can, you know, put it in, you know, we'll we'll see it. Um, but with that being said, look out for Origami Super Punch. That's coming soon. We'll be putting up updates for that. Make sure you subscribe or you follow the Honeycomb Hideout um, and subscribe to this page. And more importantly, in those links down below, you know, make sure you check out uh, Fred's books. You buy his books. You go ahead and check it out. If you want to know about manga, don't even listen to me. Listen to him. You know more about it than me. So with that being said... Thank you so much, you guys, and we will see you guys later.